My name is Matt Bell, Senior Ecologist with Mid Coast Council. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, the Gatung speaking people, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I respect their enduring connections to country. Uh, my presentation today is about koalas of the Mid Coast region from Council's perspective. The koala is an important native species, obviously. It's distinctly iconic, it's easily recognisable, and it's frequently used uh, to represent the uniqueness of Australia's wildlife. Um, an observation of a free living koala uh, is a popular and special wildlife experience and it reinforces the, the affinity that people have with and for the koala. Um, it's difficult to imagine that koalas were once so numerous that they were harvested in their millions for their fur up to about 1927. Uh, the koala though is in trouble. It's formally recognised as threatened and has been so since 1992. There's been a significant decline in the New South Wales koala population over the last three koala generations. And as Regan has indicated, likely severe impacts from the 2019 bushfires. Since the listing in 1992, the lack of a broad scale population recovery is very alarming, very concerning. Uh, but there is a high level of community concern and support for the koala and its recovery. And there is the government commitment at all levels to recovering and conserving the species. And no single agency can implement koala conservation and population recovery. It relies on a deliberate applied and coordinated effort from government at all levels, as well as research institutions, non-government organisations, advocacy groups and the community. Uh, Council seeks to work with all stakeholders to affect uh, koala conservation. And while the situation is negative, I'm reminded of the quote by David Kwamen, who uh, in his book, Song of the Dodo said, the unsatis unsatisfactory thing about despair is that besides being fruitless, it is far less exciting than hope. And I attach to this, uh, to this philosophy. Uh, conserving the koala, uh, the fundamental principles of recovering and conserving a threatened species like the koala are, are simple. Um, enhance and conserve koala habitat, uh, whether occupied or unoccupied. Um, create new habitat for corridors and movement and manage the things that are threatening adult survival and juvenile recruitment, things like cars and dogs and disease and fire. And, and that sounds simple, right? But uh, it's, it's not. The current status of koalas suggests that uh, conservation and recovery are, are complex and difficult. But if we cannot preserve and protect a cherished and iconic species such as the koala to recognise the species intrinsic right to live freely and to provide our children and their children the joy of experiencing them in the wild, then what hope do we have for conserving biodiversity more broadly? Importantly, koalas are an, umbra an umbrella species. The conservation of the koala in the landscape has cascade effects on the protection of other species and biodiversity generally and the health and condition of the natural environment. So we need to recognise that, that the koala exists as a landscape species and to manage the threats and conserve the koala requires knowledge and understanding. And while we're building this picture, the data remains uh, quite incomplete. So koalas on the mid coast is a, a similar graphic to what John presented. Um, the whole of the Mid Coast Council area is within the distributional range of the koala and koala sightings occur all across all parts from near coastal sand masses and headlands, the fertile river valleys, coastal ranges and foot slopes up to the top of the Great Divide. Uh, there do appear to be hubs of high density populations um, and we've tentatively identified them on, on, on this list of 25 hubs and these are probably smaller subsets of the areas that John described as the areas of regional koala significance. In terms of council um, working on behalf of the community, we have identified um, some priorities and our highest priority for immediate conservation management is the Kaiwarak population. Uh, it is a high density, high abundance and, and probably a key source of animals to surrounding areas. Other adopted priorities for council action include the Crowdy Bay cat eye population, the Halliday's Point population, the Barrington Village Gloucester population, and the Hawks Nest Tea Gardens endangered koala population. But every hub is important. Um, and as I say, the status of most populations is not well known. We have put our minds to 
the current population and a trend over three generations and there are significant gaps in knowledge this graphic attempts to 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 represent current thinking uh, this is intuitive it's not scientifically robust but i think the key message message and the and the key areas of 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 concern of the populations or the hubs that have seriously declined on the basis of available evidence areas that were once the engine room of of koala uh, breeding and reported sightings have have altered koala populations within them tari north cooper lands down uh, are key areas yarrett state forest um, we believe uh, have significant declines um, the halliday's point population was was once quite robust and well reported has seriously declined and has a high incidence of observed disease and these are our best guesses and this is where increasing knowledge is is particularly critical so in terms of what council is doing um, so we have on behalf of our community a long history of involvement in koala research conservation and management we've assisted or part funded studies of local koala populations we have adopted a an offset procedure where we if we're removing koala food tree species from our activities we replace them on a multiplied basis we maintain a community koala sightings online form uh, so that we can generate knowledge of existing koala um, locations and we've had over 300 community sightings to date this builds our knowledge and understanding and we have partnered with the new south wales government to uh, prepare a dog management brochure and install roadkill mitigation measures at Hawks Nest. And in this location, three koalas were, were hit and killed by vehicles in, in, in a short space of time and in a small population like the Hawks Nest population, that was a, a significant issue. Finally, our adopted biodiversity framework has adopted the koala as a priority focus species. Uh, so we're also responsible for making decisions in, in regards to land use planning and development uh, within the New South Wales planning framework. We are compiling a synthesis of knowledge of koalas across the mid coast, combining all of the reports and the investigations that have been done to date into a single uh, ready reckoner uh, and reference. Uh, we have a Australian government grant through bushfire recovery for uh, enhancement of koala habitat in a number of areas, the improvement of road safety measures, um, identifying the valuable corridors for koalas in the Tanoni area and tree giveaway programs. And we have strong partnerships with a host of government agencies and advocacy groups, of which one is Koalas in Care. We work in partnership with Koalas in Care. They uh, provide emergency care for over 800,000 hectares of the northern part of the Mid Coast Council area. Uh, they have decades of experience with koala emergency care and treatment and provide a rescue service. And they are also partner with landholders to create tree farms and, and, and install new koala habitat. Uh, so we believe one aspect of the future of koala conservation across the Mid Coast Council area relies on creating safe spaces and safe connections. This map is, is harvested from a conservation plan in the, con in the Coffs Harbour area, but demonstrates uh, the concept well, and it uh, identifies core areas of safe spaces and safe travel ways in a landscape matrix model and a strategic framework for the management of threats across the landscape. This provides the spaces for koalas to, to exist and live. The real world application of that uh, we are trialling um, or we're developing in conceptual form in the Kaiwarak area uh, centred around Tanoni. Uh, we're planning on establishing koala safe spaces on council owned land at Budawar Dam, the Bucketsway Way landfill perimeter lands, the Pegleg Creek, potentially the future dam site and the Tanoni Recreation Area Reserve. We know these areas contain koalas and high quality habitat and we can enhance that habitat and better manage threats. We'll work together with the local National Parks and Wildlife Service and, and, and Forestry Corp, as well as the community. And we wanna work with the community to make Tanoni an urban safe space. From these safe refuges, we will seek to engage with private landholders, Crown Road Reserves and others to protect vital movement corridors. And we will seek to engage with private landholders to voluntarily protect 
uh, and create additional safe refuges and habitats for koalas. And as I say, in this way, koalas should have a sufficient space to live, breed and move. And we would then seek to manage the threats in the landscape associated with cars, dogs, fire and disease while uh, engaging with uh, koalas in care to continue their tree farm work and their um, emergency care service. And this, the, the, the neatness of the safe spaces arrangement provides opportunities for suitable additional growth and development and farming and industry within a landscape model that supports the conservation of koalas. We believe this facilitates and enables um, koala preservation in that landscape context. Uh, it's a conceptual model at this stage and we would look to extend this concept more widely across priority hubs across the Mid Coast Council area. And that's the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing and I will be uh, available for the, um, the question and answer session. Thanks, Matt. I'll ask Matthew Lott from the Australian Museum. He's going to give us a presentation on koala genetics. Um, yeah, OK, so my name's Matthew Lott. I'm a geneticist at the Australian Museum, and I'm just going to be giving you a little bit of an overview today of some of the work we've done on koala genetics, um, both specifically for the Mid Coast Council and uh, across Australia more generally. So I'm hopefully not starting too basic here, but I find there tends to be a lot of assumed knowledge in these talks. So I thought it might be worth taking a minute at the very beginning to just quickly define some key terms. And that way we're all kind of on the same page moving forward. So starting really simply, what is DNA? So in a nutshell, DNA is just a large molecule which is composed of two uh, long chains of smaller molecules, which are known as nucleotides, that coil around each other to form that distinctive double helix shape. And as I'm sure you're all aware, DNA carries the genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth and reproduction of all known organisms. But DNA is a lot more than just a blueprint for making a plant or an animal. It's also a record of how that organism has changed over time. And by comparing the DNA of different species or even different populations within the same species, we can gain an understanding of how those groups have responded to environmental conditions in the past and even make predictions about how they might respond to future challenges. So you can kind of think of genetic diversity as I guess an insurance policy against future change in that the more diversity you have in a population, the more likely it is that some of those variants will be suited to future environmental climatic conditions. And of course, the more genetic diversity you have in a population, it's also less likely that negative traits will rise to high frequencies as a consequence of inbreeding. So I guess the practical implications for that as far as koalas are concerned is that by studying their DNA, we can identify genetic boundaries between discrete populations. We can determine the approximate time periods at which genetically distinct populations diverged. We can estimate levels of migration between geographically proximate populations. And we might even be able to gain an understanding of how environmental or anthropogenic selection pressures are driving either the emergence of genetic variation or its loss. Um, so historically, wildlife conservation involving genetics has focused on two aspects that should theoretically enhance genetic diversity. So the first is using things like wildlife corridors and protected areas to maintain population connectivity. So ensuring that koalas are able to exchange genetic material by moving between geographically proximate areas. And the second is maintaining relatively large population sizes. So small populations are at risk of uh, going extinct due to something called demographic stochasticity, which is random changes in population size over time due to variation in individual survival and reproductive success. So if you imagine you've got a population of a thousand koalas and five of them fall out of a tree during a thunderstorm, that's obviously very sad, but not necessarily a huge problem for the population as a whole. But if you have a population of just 10 koalas and the same thing happens, then in one fell swoop, you've lost 50% of your population. So that's why small populations can be dangerous. And smaller populations are also subject to what we call genetic drift, which is a change in the frequency of existing gene variants due to random chance rather than natural selection. And over time, genetic drift can erode um, essential genetic diversity if left unchecked. So that's kind of how we used to approach things, but with the rapid loss of biodiversity associated with, um, you know, anthropogenic climate change, habitat modification, that kind of thing, 
there's been a sort of shift to advocating for more active intervention. So that's things like rewilding, uh, so taking animals from captivity and returning them to the wild, assisted gene flow, moving animals between wild populations where we think there could be a deficit of genetic diversity. And people have even started to suggest pretty radical things like assisted evolution and artificial selection. So basically trying to predict what traits are gonna be beneficial in certain environments in the future and then try to identify animals that have those traits and use them as breeding stock. So it's an interesting idea. It's a very controversial idea for reasons I'll get into in the next slide. And it's certainly not something I necessarily advocate. Um, but the ultimate objective of both passive and active conservation strategies is to achieve autonomous self-regulating population species and ecosystems. So I was tossing up whether to include this slide at all because it potentially muddies the water a little bit. But if you want to talk about using DNA-based techniques to aid koala conservation, you are going to come across these terms. So we may as well define them now. So historically speaking, most conservation studies have focused on what we call neutral genetic variation, which involves looking at parts of the animal's DNA or genome that don't appear to be under strong natural selection. And there are those who now argue that the importance of neutral genetic diversity to threaten species conservation has kind of been exaggerated. And instead, what we should be focusing on is what they call functional genetic diversity. Um, so functional genetic diversity is basically genetic diversity that underlie traits that appear to vary across the species range in response to factors like climate, habitat type, disease, etc., and might therefore inform a species ability to adapt to future challenges. So as I say, it's a very interesting idea. Um, it's a fascinating area of research and it's something that I'm involved in myself. Um, but I and a lot of my colleagues feel like it's a little bit premature to start talking about management implications of functional genetic diversity. Uh, most of the studies we have to date suggest that conserving genome-wide neutral genetic variation is still kind of the best approach and focusing conservation efforts on putatively functional regions it's only very rarely feasible. It's often misleading and it can be counterproductive um, if you don't go in with all the right information. So that's just something uh, to be aware of. So the last thing I'm just gonna briefly touch on before we start to get into some data is uh, to talk about how the rapid rate of technological progress has changed how we investigate some of these questions. So in the past, most conservation studies have focused on what we call microsatellites, which are basically just tracts of repetitive DNA in which certain motifs of nucleotides are repeated a certain number of times, uh, sometimes five up to 50 times. And we might use 10 or 20 microsatellites in a study. Uh, but now that sort of whole genome sequencing is becoming available, we've seen a shift to something called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, which is basically looking at variations at a single position in a DNA sequence among individuals within a populations or species. And we might have thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of SNPs from across the animal's genome, which really increases the resolution and scale of the studies that we're able to do compared to microsatellites. So one issue we're having is that different methods of genotyping are not necessarily directly comparable. And to date, there's been little consistency across different monitoring programs. Uh, large parts of that is due to funding and what technologies were available at the time. But that's slowly starting to change and there's increasing well, there's been a push across multiple institutions to kind of try and come up with a standardized uh, paradigm for monitoring koalas and their genetic diversity specifically. So this has already been touched on a little bit, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but these are basically some of the management divisions that have been proposed for koalas in New South Wales. On the left there, you have got your koala management areas or KMAs, which provide regional divisions across New South Wales. And on the right there, we've got the 48 arcs or areas of regional koala significance, which have already been mentioned. So this is just showing an overview of where we currently have material from that's stored in the Australian Museum Koala Biobank. Um, so you can see there we've got quite good coverage across the 48 arcs and most of the KMAs, excluding the far west where koalas are very thin on the ground. All right, so this is just uh, some data from a very preliminary uh, survey we did of genetic diversity of mid, uh, koalas from the Mid Coast Council area. So what you're looking at there is what's called uh, PCOA or principal coordinate analysis, uh, which is basically just a graphical representation of the genetic similarities between our koala samples. Now, each dot there represents an individual koala and the koalas are color coded by their region of origin. 
And all you really need to understand to interpret this PCOA is that the further apart two dots are on the graph, the less genetically similar those animals are. And the distribution of animals we see here is really indicative of a phenomenon called isolation by distance, basically meaning that animals that live further apart are more genetically distinct than animals that live closer together. And you can see that animals from the Mid Coast Council, Port Macquarie and Pine Creek State Forest all kind of group together as a single population. So from a management perspective, we probably don't need to think of them as separate entities. Again, this is just a quick overview of the comparative levels of genetic diversity across a group of different sampling sites uh, based on mean internal relatedness. So the centre lines there represent the median values, while the box limits depict the upper and lower quantiles, outliers are depicted as circles. And the takeaway here is basically just that based on our preliminary survey of koalas in the Mid Coast Council area, they don't seem to be significantly any more or less genetically diverse than koalas from the other areas. This is just to give some context to some of the information I've just provided to see how koala genetic diversity is structured across uh, New South Wales as a whole. So you can see here that when we look across New South Wales as a whole, there's three major groups of koalas, which we've identified as Southeast Queensland, Mid Coast New South Wales and South Coast New South Wales. And the reasons for those will become apparent on the next slide. So this is how we find the distribution of genetic diversity breaks down across Australia as a whole. Um, you can see that we've got five major genetic clusters of koalas that are all separated by prominent biogeographic barriers that all date back to the Pleistocene. And the most important ones for New South Wales are the Clarence River Corridor, uh, the Sydney Basin, and um, the Hunter Barrier has been suggested, but we're not seeing too much evidence of that. So you can kind of think of this as just Ancestry.com for koalas. What it's showing you is the relative contribution of each population cluster to the genome of each koala. And all you really need to take away from this is that koalas do seem to move around between population clusters quite a bit because you have individuals of mixed ancestry. So their parents originated from two different major genetic clusters. Uh, this is just some further um, statistics on genetic diversity in koalas. Uh, the main takeaway here is that when you look at the relative contributions of genetic diversity at different management levels, we find that most of the individual, uh, most of the variation occurs at individual koalas. So they're probably what we need to prioritize protecting rather than arbitrary areas or management units. So that's pretty much it from me. So thank you very much for that. So Edward, Narayan um, is going to uh, give us a, a, a talk now. He's from the University of Queensland and he's going to talk about stress and koalas. Thanks, Edward. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation to give a presentation today. Um, and I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, their past and present. Um, koalas and stress, which one comes first? Obviously, we know the stress is overwhelming on koalas. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'd get a fair understanding of how the physiology works and hopefully we can um, use the technology to our ecological and management systems for koalas. So um, the site of the koala on the land, obviously we have a lot of work going on from the previous presentations, uh, a lot of work on the ground to save the koalas. We know it's not just by chance that you see a koala on the ground. It's actually a nexus of complex ecological, physiological, and behavioral uh, interactions with the environment that eventually leads to a koala having to be, uh, or luckily being rescued or un unluckily being found on the roadside. So it's a very complex uh, topic. And what we are trying to do is, in a little way, understand a bit on the psyche of the koalas, they are a very resilient animal, but hopefully we can try to use some of the methods that we have come up with to understand what they're telling us with regards to the state of the environment in which we are standing on today. So the focus of my research uh, here now, I'm at the University of Queensland. I was in uh, Sydney just before COVID uh, and now here, but the thing is we are able to apply this three-dimensional um, stress axis, which um, enables uh, the researchers to apply the interactions between the, um, between the physiology and the behavior of animals. And not just uh, 
in relation to a one directional relationship, we, we want to be able to look at bi-directional and multi-directional relationships. So my work on, on frogs during my PhD, and now I'm lucky to be studying koalas. So I feel really privileged by all this. Um, but the thing is, we know that koalas actually are showing the physical signs of stress. Well, the thing is you have the brain and the physiology. So stress is not a necessarily a bad thing. So like I said, anything with a beating heart, we face stress day in, day out. Like with COVID lockdown, we all are under stress every day we hear the news. But the thing with koalas is that or any native wild animal, they are really wild. And the wilderness and their physiology actually is there to support them to cope with the environmental challenges. So they have been here to tell the tale of Australia. So the thing is, what we need to be able to understand is that the stress of uh, any, um, any living organism, obviously even microorganisms go through stress, they act on a uh, spectrum. So you must have heard of, you know, some of us, um, you know, might have some depression. So we are at the upper end of the stress threshold. So we have chronic stress. So what I'm trying to do in a little way is understand where the koalas are sitting in the spectrum of stress in our research group. And then we can hopefully help the on ground work with regards to the conservation of koalas. Um, so the koala stress syndrome is something we are fairly well aware of. Um, they tend to be really lethargic and show no response and fairly mob, mob, mob high levels of morbidity and risks to mortality. So the first question is, do they actually respond to stress? So a good place to start was using zoo animals. So I've been working with zoos for a while and we were able to see that uh, male koalas heavily aggressive uh, female koalas are happy to be sort of participating in photography um, and handling at zoos, as long as she doesn't have a little pouch young. And if that makes sense, you know, got two little nippers at home and blokes have to do dishwashing as well in this lockdown. Well, always, I think, uh, and, and, uh, and participate in that social interactions. But we are all different and uh, koalas um, within population variance is really important to understand before we go into understanding between population and environmental variance. So some of the things from the beginning is you can see that there's the adrenal gland of a koala. So we all have near our kidneys. Uh, in the fish, it's actually closer to the head, but in koalas and ourselves, we have this thing called the adrenal gland. And in the early days, when all the really cool research was happening, um, the adrenal gland would be used to bulge up when the animal is under stress, but by then you'd, you'd be in the freezer. So you have the brain of the koala and you have the spinal nerve. Um, and so now what we have got is we've been able to um, validate methods where you can pick up the stress levels from minimally invasive samples. So we need to be animal welfare friendly. And that's where some of our research are, are stemming from. So with minimal disturbance to the koalas, we are able to look at um, stress uh, in the feces. And uh, now we've actually started to look at stress in hair. So I wouldn't bore, bore you, you with a lot of uh, background stuff, but we've actually been able to validate stress by um, spiking the HPA axis and demonstrating the response in the blood, as well as in the feces. Koalas have a complex gut system, so you'd have a lengthier delay in the uh, presence of the uh, metabolites in the excreta. So I was lucky to work with the rescuers around New South Wales. Um, and, uh, and we've been able to sort of tap a bit into the physiology of the koalas. And also some of the work that we have been doing in South Australia as well. So we've just looking at some examples over here of the lab methods. A lot of um, students are involved in this sort of research. Uh, we validate our methods quite beautifully and we publish in scientific journals. Um, so what we see is that the koalas are actually found in different environments. So you might have Nutsi here, for example, this is from South Australia um, in a rural fragmented fringe. 
mecca and met actually again in a fragmented area. Some koalas move between habitats um, and some are actually found in forested areas. So what were the levels of stress in these animals? And we pump in a lot of data from the um, koala hospitals that is really useful for us uh, academics. <laughs> and what we've got here, it's Nutsi, for example, you see their fecal cortisol levels are over the roof. They come in with heavy levels of stress. Some koalas also end up um, having diabetes due to the, uh, the um, provision of uh, corticosteroids. So every animal is different. Just giving some examples, for example, Matt coming in with a lumbar pain, unable to walk. This line shows the stress levels in him. And uh, this is a baseline stress level of a fairly um, relaxed koala um, in the wild. So you can see that animals that come in, uh, for example, Nigel with uh, flat on the ground, ruling heavy stress all throughout. And um, it's, it's really sad. But it's not all a sad story. A lot of uh, intervention that's been provided by the um, clinicians and the rescuers and the koala carers actually demonstrates and links to the physiology. So we actually start to see the acute stress response waning down through time. So every animal is different. That's what I believe in, that we need to provide individual care rather than uh, a um, bucket approach. You can actually see uh, that animals which come in uh, negative chlamydia, mild, uh, stress from the wild, they actually tend to be um, recover quite uh, quickly and, and be released um, uh, or, or having to, you know, being um, released with the carers. Some animals have to be euthanized eventually. So the question at the moment uh, explored with my PhD student, uh, Renee, who is also in the audience, uh, she's looking here in Queensland, what's the complexity here that actually leads to koalas, maybe fairly happy, uh, fairly healthy koalas, which eventually have to be euthanized. So we are trying to understand that topic as well, but the story is already out there. The work we've done in New South Wales and uh, in South Australia, the euthanasia rate is very high. So that's something to keep an eye out on if you want to rehabilitate and have more koalas back in the wild by 2050. What we also see is that those animals that come in a, with a lot of stress eventually have to be euthanized, that's fine. Um, there's always uh, animal welfare that is paramount. Uh, and so there's a logical decision uh, step being involved uh, in the, on the surgical table. But the question is if they are fairly healthy young animals that are having to be rescued as we know that animals are you know, being bombarded with stress at the moment uh, in, the, in the past few uh, years, what do we do to them to help them? So I ran a marathon of stresses uh, everyone was asking me, how do you compare things? So in the last 10 years, the little work that I have been doing with koalas, here we um, looked at healthy wild males, females, some infection, dog attack, bushfires, land clearance. Um, we found that you have two things. You have the state and the uh, environmental event. So the state of the land seems to be a big player and the events like dog attack and um, vehicle collisions, they are sort of superimposed by these bigger state issues that's uh, around us at the moment. So I'm trying to understand this a bit uh, at the moment with the help of uh, uh, the koala hospitals here in Queensland and New South Wales and South Australia. And we've seen- two minutes. Thanks. Uh, we've seen koalas having to come to the, closer to the city. So this was on ABC recently. Um, why are they doing that? So do we need to work with uh, land, uh, you know, urban uh, planners and provide more space for the koalas to be able to sustain uh, themselves? Uh, and that's where I'll leave you with it. Uh, koalas and stress. Koalas were here before stress uh, uh, and stress is a very important part of our ecology, but uh, we want to reverse stress by humane intervention. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators, uh, the funding body and my students and uh, the listeners. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. Uh, that was really uh, interesting. A lot of food for thought. Shane, I'll ask you to share your screen. So why do koalas come into care? Well, for us and probably throughout New South Wales and Queensland, 
the number one reason that koalas come into, into care is disease. And the number one is chlamydia. More often than not, koalas come in with the ocular form of the disease chlamydia. And unless um, animals present with an early stage infection, if they come in late, uh, quite commonly the, the disease is so advanced that um, uh, they're not treatable. And if they're left in the wild, the, um, some koalas can get over it, but the majority of them end up blind. The urogenital form of the disease, commonly called wet bottom, um, affects the reproductive tract and the and kidneys, and it renders females infertile, and they can die from very severe renal disease. And another thing that can happen is they can get fly strike and uh, end up um, suffering with a lot of maggot infestation. The second most important reason for animals that come into care is vehicle strike. And this tends to occur, of course, in hotspots, such as busy roads that intersect through good koala habitat. Koalas, like most animals, even though there's refuges and linkages and, and plenty of areas for koalas to go, if they want to go from A to B, they will cut across wherever they are. And if that means crossing a busy road rather than going round the edge, they will do it. And that's why in many cases, it ends up a fatal result. The third most common thing for animals to come into care is domestic dog attack. And uh, in, in, a, in our region, we record the, uh, the breeds of dogs that um, cause these attacks. And the majority in our region is the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. We don't particularly worry about wild dogs being an issue for koalas and that that's for another discussion, but um, we feel it's only really domestic dogs are the problem for koalas. And the majority of koalas that come in, 75% of all koalas admitted into care from dog attacks die from the amount of traumatic injury to their internal organs. Other reasons that animals come into care, and, and people, most people don't even realise this, is cattle tend to attack koalas. Koalas come to ground and cut across a, a paddock and the cattle will kill them. We also would like to alert LLS that there's a likelihood that deer will do the same thing to koalas. Other reasons for admission is neoplasias as in cancers and the two most common ones are lymphomas and leukemias. Mange is a very rare thing in koalas in New South Wales and Queensland, although it does occur and of course it's highly zoonotic. There's a number of parasites that are really starting to emerge in koala um, clinical side of things now too, something else to be aware of. And of course, other animals that come into care come in because they're displaced. They are literally running up and down the road with nowhere to go. Drought, as we all know, the last 10 years have been horrific and it's played a huge impact on koala populations, even on the coast. This is what we classically see with koalas that come in as a result of drought. They're emaciated, they're chronically dehydrated, and the majority of them are in advanced renal failure. And, um, and most of them are euthanized. And of course, the fires of 2019 as well as and 2020, as well as many other fires, tend to come after a severe drought. So these animals are already heavily compromised from drought, and then fires happen. And this is a classic example of, of a koala that's come in courtesy of being burnt in a fire. This one, of course, was not treatable and was euthanized. And when koalas come in from fires and they're burnt, often they get a double whammy. There's so much energy goes in to try to heal the burns and, and, and deal with everything that's going on and the stresses involved in it all that chlamydia tends to emerge. So you then have to treat the animal for chlamydia, as well as treating the burns injuries. So why does this all happen? Why do animals come into care? Everyone goes on about key threatening processes, but there's something that's overlooked a lot, and that's understanding the dynamics of a koala population, how a population actually works. Now, there's a myth out there that people say koalas are a solitary animal. Well, they are to some degree, but in actual fact, they're not. Koalas live in a, in a very complex social system, system where there's a, a very strong hierarchy. And 
And the koala populations, when they live in this system and, and anthropogenic chains such as what we do come along, we just disrupt and, and destroy these populations so quickly. And that's why we see what we see. This is a really simplistic stylized diagram to explain um, a koala population. Within a population, the animals live in a home range and they stay in that home range for their entire lives unless um, age or infirmity or some human inter in intervention changes that. All the, the home ranges overlap with each other. They have shared trees at the boundaries and they have trees they avoid. And the higher ranking animals obviously get the best quality habitat because they're doing the breeding and higher ranking males have all the females around them and they exchange breeding rights in, in exchange for, um, you know, looking after the females. And the lower ranking animals tend to live in the margins of the population and there's recruitment going in and out of this population at all time. This is, uh, Brad Laws will know about this one, but this is a, a research project done with Forestry Corporation New South Wales, uh, DPI and the Koala Hospital, where we were looking at populations of koalas in state forest and how they moved across the landscape in, in logged and unlogged areas. And it's a beautiful example showing the home ranges and how animals stay within the home ranges and how tight they are. And these animals, um, they used a lot of the trees, but they, we also found that they'd feed on some trees and then they may not come back to those trees for many months. Can you imagine from that green line down, if a development happened and all those, um, that was clear felled and all those animals were kicked out of this home, the, the, you know, this population, and they were forced to move up into where other animals live. They would be moving into animals that already occupy a home range and they would immediately get booted out. So what you're having is these animals that just disperse everywhere, have nowhere to live and end up either copping being hit by a car or attacked by dogs, or they literally die of starvation. This is another uh, project done with Port Macquarie Hastings Council and Rebecca Montague Drake, New South Wales Government and the Koala Hospital, where we looked at a population of koalas. This is just on the edge of Port Macquarie, looking at peri-urban populations of koalas and in a national park and to see whether they, whether, where they moved. And we certainly found that animals that live, this, as you can see, this is a home range of one animal. Um, they lived in, in the national park, but they also moved into town and fed on street trees. And street trees for koalas and peri-urban and urban areas are very, very important to their survival. Another thing that was found out of this is that over a year, animals petitioned their home ranges into summer and winter, which makes sense. They'd move into the cooler, more moist areas in summer and move in to the more warmer areas during winter. And this is something to take into consideration in managing areas because say you're doing a survey uh, um, of, of some habitat to see whether there's occupancy and you find that there's no koalas actually in this particular spot, what may be happening is these koalas may actually be down the other end of their home range at that particular time. This is another one from the same um, project that we were doing where the koala spent an awful lot of time in, in the, uh, the, the forested area, but also moved in and you can see fed on the, street, on the street trees. We would like to see at, at the Koala Hospital that street trees in very quiet urban areas should be made, and if there's no overhead power lines, of course, should be made as koala food trees. It's a really good resource to use. And then all of these, these street trees can have linkages into refugia and reserves and making good use of the area. It kind of gets us very upset when we see all these exotic trees in, in, in areas where koalas could be feeding. And it's something to take into consideration. But there needs to be a greater understanding of how koala populations actually work and the behavior of that entire population um, functions. We ask the question, can humans and koalas coexist? And we, our answer is yes with good, careful management of forested areas and urban and peri-urban areas and rural areas, 
They can, provided we, we, we understand how a koala population works, the behaviour of that population, and how we very carefully manage the forested areas and planting to suit the behaviour of how that, that population works. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Rebecca Montague-Drake is going to give a presentation now and she's going to talk about partnerships and conservation. So today's more a bit of an overview about the kinds of activities that the Koala Recovery Partnership do rather than a deep dive into some of the um, results of our analysis. So what is the Koala Recovery Partnership? I'm sorry, it's, there we go. Um, it's funded by the New South Wales um, Saving Our Species Program, the Koala Hospital, Kempsey Council and Port Macquarie Hastings Council. Um, it's hosted by an, a regional sort of council entity called the Mid-North Coast Joint Organisation. It employs one koala ecologist, that is myself, and it's a three-year project which will conclude um, this coming March. So the Koala Recovery Partnership undertakes a range of activities, including programs looking at habitat creation, education, habitat protection, research, and of course, supporting a wide range of stakeholders. We see ourselves as a bit of a coordinating body between a whole bunch of other key stakeholders operating in the koala space, and particularly where we can sort of pull together our good local knowledge um, and pair that with organisations with the science and the on-ground outcomes. So I'll just run through some of those, those main activities that we've um, undertaken and talk about some of the main initiatives in that space before at the end of this talk, you know, giving you a bit of experience, I guess, about the things that have broadly worked um, in our two and a bit years to date, and those other areas that have been a bit more of a challenge. So one area that we've worked in is the scheme of habitat creation. So we have been able to direct some funding towards our local land care groups, the Hastings and the Maclay land care groups, for them to undertake planting of key koala habitat. We've also provided assistance with preparing habitat restoration guidelines, notably for one prepared by, for this region by Maclay Landcare, as well as the statewide habitat restoration guidelines. We've also done a project with Maclay Landcare called Tree Changes for, a Tree Change for Koalas in the Maclay, where we worked with local land care nurseries to propagate or train volunteers in how to propagate koala feed trees through appropriate seed collection and so forth. And then those plants are now being given away to the community at different events and so forth. Another thing that we did in the space of habitat creation was create the koala habitat planting map. And it really promotes the message of the right trees in the right location for maximum benefit. The map is an online document prepared through the ARC Story platform, so an Ezra product. It allows any landholder in the Hastings and Maclay to zoom into their particular property and click on an individual area of their property to see which koala feed trees they would be best to plant. Too often we were seeing landholders plant swamp mahoganies out, way out in the hinterland up on top of a mountain and wondering why they didn't succeed. So this provides some resources to do that. The list of koala feed trees has also been, um, had a sort of climate readiness factor applied to it, um, where we have prioritised uh, the tree species in order to account for climate readiness by looking at um, koala feed tree usage in bioregions to the north and to the west of us. And already, um, thanks to Midnight Quest Council, we've had some discussions with them who've shown interest in this area as well. The other big area that we work in is habitat protection. So currently we are partnering with the Biodiversity Conservation Trust and the North Coast Local Land Services, Olivia, who I saw is here today, to deliver the conservation partner program agreements to private properties that have quality koala habitat. To date, we have protected 221.5 hectares of koala habitat in the Belmore River um, area of regional koala significance, located between the Hastings River in the south and the Belmore River to the north. And it has been a real privilege to work on these private properties with such amazing um, conservation values, both for koalas and many other species. The Koala Recovery Partnership has also provided assistance to the National Parks and Wildlife Service Reserve Acquisition Team to provide local information about the importance of different areas of koala habitat to help them make decisions about reserve acquisition. 
And one notable area, um, there was a recent addition to the Mariah River National Park, it was some stunning area of koala habitat. We also work in a space of education and community engagement. An example of a program that we've delivered in this space is called Koala Smart. This was delivered in 2019 to 700 students from 30 schools across the Hastings Maclay and formed the question, basically, the question was pitched to the students, what would you do to save the koala? And it was a fantastic initiative to see, so children were educated about the threats that face koalas in the first instance, um, followed by they had to come up with novel ideas to sort of help save the koala. So a, a novel, um, a novel um, way of educating school students. Um, the program was part, we partnered with Attacking Point Lions Club to deliver this program. And now the program has been um, picked up by the Saving Our Species, um, further funding from Saving Our Species and the, the material sort of better enmeshed into the New South Wales curriculum where it's currently being delivered to other schools as well across the state. Again, in the space of education and community engagement, basically um, you end up being a bit of the point of local contact for all things koalas. So a range of talks, answering landholders' emails about koala-related matters, um, conducting different field days, phone calls and events. So in the space of events, we're currently planning a cultural um, event where we will be singing up koalas for the breeding season um, with our Birapai um, local Aboriginal people, which will be very exciting. We also undertake research. So one program was which we've just recently completed last spring was understanding koala habitat in the Hastings Maclay region. We surveyed 209 sites across 41 different plant community types. Each site was first surveyed by a botanist to verify the plant community type present and collect habitat variables. Each site was then surveyed for koala occupancy, primarily using koala detection dogs. We also surveyed 131 sites using the audio moth acoustic detection devices discussed by Brad earlier. And 109 of those sites were simultaneously surveyed by both dogs and the moths in the same season. It was great to see that across our region, um, we had about 60% occupancy um, across our site. So very similar to that reported by Brad earlier, that was through the dog detection, 60% occupancy of our sites. Um, so you can see that in the left picture. And on the right, you can see the number of PCTs, the plant community types that we were able to pick up for inclusion in our study, representing the vast bulk of the habitat that we have in this region. Just a few really interesting findings um, was the importance of, the sh of shrubby forest to koalas as opposed to grassy forests. Consistently, these performed above expectations um, about their implied occupancy, um, performing quite well. And to us, that says that any kind of activity that, and that, that's so important for koalas to be able to sort of um, take refuge in these shrubs through our radio tracking study on hot days, we often see them descend from that, the high up in the canopy or particularly windy days and come down into that sort of shrub, the, the tall shrub layer to take refuge. So the take home message there is that any kind of um, activity that simplifies koala habitat may reduce the likely occupancy of koalas at a site. Across the board, we also had a great fit with the New South Wales Koala Habitat Suitability Model, which is, tells us that for this part of the world, that's a fantastic resource for land managers to use to tell them where good koala habitat might be located. We were also interested in looking at um, how well the, um, the New South Wales SEPs performed at predicting koala habitat. Um, and while the old SEP 44 only had about 60% sort of accuracy or 60% of the sites actually weren't picked up by it as being koala habitat that were occupied, um, the, the new SEP performed much better in predicting um, occupied koala habitat. However, one of the things that we did find was that um, under the SEP, as you might know, um, vegetation has to have at least 15% cover by counts of koala feed trees in order to be considered as koala habitat. Whereas in our study, um, sites that still had zero to 10% um, cover of koala feed trees actually had um, a high level of koala occupancy as well. Um, 
it was also interesting in our study to see um, where koalas were, as John referred to before, in terms of generational persistence. And it was fantastic for us to pick up koalas in some areas, such as around Southwest Rocks and out in the hinterland, where they hadn't been seen for the last two generations, implying some sort of recovery in those landscapes. Um, I won't delve into this, Shane's already touched on it well, but we also took this the year in the life of the koala study, spatio-temporal partitioning of koala habitat. And you can see that figure that Shane put up before, but this time colour coded by the seasons. So up, moving up slope in the summer into those areas with more um, sunshine and so forth, and then down into the forested wetland components in those hotter, drier months. Um, the other big thing is, of course, is stakeholder support. We, we've provided support for a whole range of different things, set reviews, guidelines reviews, assistance to researchers, assistance with the Great Koala National Park Review undertaken by the University of New, um, Newcastle, the New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry. To quickly finish up, um, as Regan wanted me to share with you today, the, sort of the challenges that we've um, experienced along the way, the winds and so forth. So I feel like in all the work that we've done, some of the best wins have been in terms of actually protecting good quality habitat in perpetuity through assisting the reserve, National Parks Reserves acquisition team and working in the space of the BCT Conservation Partners Program, that we've been able to provide some really good data sets for future use. The habitat restoration work has certainly been rewarding but we must remind ourselves that it's often um, small gains for big dollars and creating resources such as the koala habitat planting map. More indirect wins that it's um, less tangible to see the outcomes of your efforts are in the space of community education, advocacy, again, the data sets and not really knowing, I guess, how it will go in time and stakeholder support. And some of the harder grounds that it's hard to get traction in, we started a, a program looking at fire management in koalas, but the lesson that I felt we learned there was it, that was better addressed at the state level rather than the regional level. Um, in the space of comprehensive koala plans and management, I think it's hard with community expectations um, in terms of when you work with a government body, but you're badged as something like the Koala Recovery Partnership, what the community might think that you should be fighting, what wars you might be fighting, and it's not your place. We've done a lot of analysis looking at road strike and dog attack in the region, looking at hotspots. But again, while we can see these patterns and we can see these problem areas, it's very, very hard um, to address these intrinsic problems. So, and the lessons learned for the partnership, I guess, um, if people are thinking about setting one up, is the clear ins and outs of the project scope and trying to keep a, a quite um, narrow focus for the best impetus, um, that our partnerships with other key agencies have been very fruitful, that our partnerships with community groups have also been very fruitful, but do take more time to sort of nurture and develop and um, continue to work with them, and that it's important to articulate to the community the focus of any project. Um, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. The next one is from Victor Stephenson, who's going to talk about fire management or cultural burning and koalas. Um, Victor, I'm not sure if you have a presentation, but if you do, can you please share your screen for us? Uh, thanks for that. Um, no, I don't have a presentation in terms of uh, slides, but I do have um, <clears throat> a yarn and updates. And I just want to say, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this. And um, and it's been really great to hear everyone, um, great work that they've been doing on koalas um, as well. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> all those that don't know me, I'm Victor Stevenson. I'm a Indigenous fire practitioner um, from North Queensland and Takala, which obviously don't have koalas, but overall, i um, been working a lot in the southern areas of Australia and with many communities over the last um, close to 20 years now with fire management and reading landscapes. Um, and even though we don't have koalas in the north, fire generally is all about looking after every single animal in our country. And when we look at managing our landscapes with fire, um, particularly around animals, the animals are, um, they know the type of fire regimes that, that we talk about in terms of the right timing for ecosystems, um, soils and trees. And um, in a lot of landscapes as well that um, don't need fire or might not have seen as much fire in the past have also been changed and opened up. 
and sometimes in some situations, uh, specifically in southern areas too, as well as some even in the north, there are situations where we need to apply fire um, to improve landscapes and to protect um, certain species and trees um, until that country is able to um, get greater health and a greater resilience um, in, um, you know, from wildfires. And, and there's many levels of health of two ecosystems that consider um, you know, how much fire ecosystems may need um, in the short term and in the long term, and, and also in terms of um, continuously too, um, for fire prone systems that need fire, um, you know, continuously. So the work that um, that we do with animals, with fire and with indigenous knowledge is very holistic and interconnected with everything. So when we apply a management um, such as fire, it's there to benefit the country. Because what you have to remember, um, the, the fire management is based on food. It's based on um, bringing up food plants. It's based on protecting food plants. Um, and it's based um, on a very um, important connection to landscapes to make country healthy, um, and to avoid wildfires, to avoid the destruction of landscapes um, and um, you know harming our animals as well. And when we talk about our animals, they know our fire. And so for example, um, when we burn country, the behavior that animals, what animals do in terms of response to our fires, um, they're all quite unique to um, every animal. And um, a lot of animals come to the fire and go to the burns and they come to the fire after the burn and they forage through the ashes and through the burnt country and look for food or, and so forth. And so there's many um, reasons why animals need the fire too. And also um, their, their behavior and their gestures when we light fires tells us that they, they actually know the fire. And that's why they come to the fire. They know what to expect from the cool burns and and not just with hunting animals, but with the regrowth of shoots and grasses and medicines and foods and um, plant foods and seeds and all those sort of things as well. So, you know, it's really um, a holistic management. And I guess that's what I'm trying to pinpoint here is that um, when we look after the land, we look after every animal. And particularly around um, koalas, like no matter what the animal, um, you know, it's all based on looking after all of them. And koalas aren't the only one that are, that are threatened in those areas where the koalas are. You know, we have the emus that have disappeared in some areas there as well. And quolls and many other types of animals that have already suffered um, demise in many areas there and not even there. And so when we talk about fire management, we like to talk about protecting all the animals and making that habitat healthy for all of them and finding that right balance for all animals is what um, indigenous man, uh, knowledge and, and land management has been able to achieve um, over thousands of years. And that is why when the settlers first came, they saw all the animals here, you know? So it's that real fine line of living with country. And as you saw on some of the presentations, the koalas moving into town and the koalas being um, territorial, just like tribes of Aboriginal people, just like um, different ecosystems, everything's respected and has its place. And, and um, it seems to be that um, people um, don't understand that, don't understand how they fit into that and, and how we support that and understand that. And so it's good to see all the research that is going on to help to keep building that um, connection and building that knowledge around those koalas. But what we are looking for and what we're looking at um, through fire sticks and through a lot of the work through a lot of indigenous communities um, that have koala habitats is to manage that landscape for all animals, including the koala. And so recently we've had um, one of our programs in uh, South, uh, in Southern New South Wales with Dan Morgan. And Dan Morgan's one of our, um, one of the human people down there that is running um, his projects through Fire Sticks and, and support of many agencies actually, including um, WWF. And um, it's working on their first koala projects down there. And we'd like to see um, um, the ability to demonstrate Indigenous land management for koala habitat. And so the first one has been kicked off there with um, uh, Dan Morgan in the South Coast down there, and along with um, some other the traditional owners there. And um, they're working also in partners with WWF and Plastics and, um, and so forth, and some universities in, re in regards to um, starting to um, 
get that process of giving Indigenous knowledge uh, an opportunity to demonstrate um, how it can uh, contribute to, um, you know, making better habitats for koalas and, you know, get greater well-being in general overall. And I think through there, they're looking at infrared um, technologies to help um, with the tracking of koalas. And that's what we're mostly interested in, is where the koalas are going, um, what's going on, and what I've been seeing here is exactly the sort of information that we love to collaborate with and work with people around um, managing landscapes with fires. Uh, Dan Morgan has just recently done um, some burns in koala habitat this last week, and that koala habitat um, um, had scats, and um, he's been doing those first burns. And when I went down and assessed those landscapes with him, those landscapes, um, you know, the trees weren't as healthy as they should look, um, especially after a great wet season that um, that was had in that area. And also the um, the ground cover as well. Um, it showed a lot of um, leaf litter and, um, and rubbish and dry grasses and no um, diversity of, of, um, of uh, vegetation. So when we look at the, the tree species and the soil types, um, we know uh, what sort of medicines and foods that should be in those areas um, and what identity of those ecosystems are. And I guess that's one of the most important fundamental um, things that we need to do is understanding the identity of ecosystems um, and knowing um, what those ecosystems are and what is um, and what those ecosystems should have growing inside there and living inside those systems. And that's basically um, how we assess everything when we come to any type of land management is looking at that ecosystem. And if that ecosystem isn't healthy and doesn't have certain food plants on the floor or doesn't have any native grasses, then that's alarming that tells us that all the animals are struggling too. And so the health of our ecosystems and the identity of those ecosystems is important to our identity to people. And if it's important to the identity of people, then it's gotta be extremely important to the identity of the animals too, and their homes and their homelands and ranges and where they live and, and the values that, um, that they have. And when we see the behavior of the ko koalas, you see a connection to, um, you know, to the clan groups of people as well and how they move around and territorial, like I mentioned earlier. And so if there's evidence already of connection that way, and we see so much more evidence in the different ecosystems and trees and how all the ecosystems in the country and how um, that is also very assimilated to different clan groups and people and how people have evolved with landscapes to live closely with landscapes. Um, is the sustainable way that we contribute to um, ongoing survival of these populations. So we don't need to just look at the koalas, we also need to look at ourselves and programs um, like, um, you know, uh, how we can contribute and, and do better, which is good to see in the program earlier, working with the children, you know, that's really fantastic that um, the kids are getting involved early. And I think that's crucial because when we look at the ongoing survival of the landscape, um, it's intergenerational. It's not like um, healing country year or week or things like that that only last a year. It's it, this is it. these sort of things that we're looking at now is intergenerational, and will go on for a long time um, until things are really stable. And finding that stableness is um, is what we're all achieving for for and and you know in our goals. But what we see through indigenous knowledge is the opportunity to fast track. Um, you know, um, opportunities to fast track solutions and to um, be able to demonstrate how um, that knowledge systems can support the fires as support, um, you know, animals and the habitats, and especially the koalas. So it's been a long time now being wanting to speak at something like this and um, also to get Indigenous knowledge and, and the fire management involved in the koala scene. And so this is really exciting for us. Um, and, um, and I'm so really excited about the, the work that Dan Morgan's leading and also stretching into the Northern um, New South Wales and Southern Queensland. Um, we're doing a training program, a three-year training program where we're teaching practitioners. And within that training program, we're hoping to integrate the, um, as it will grow and evolve and, and it's also regionalized. So that training program we're doing um, with those with koala habitats, um, that's what we're hoping to do to, to um, to involve that 
type of training as well within that three year period for the fire practitioners. Um, so that these sort of projects around the monitoring of certain species of animals are, are integrated with the training of practitioners as well. And that's what, um, what we're striving for through, those, um, through that training model. And that's what the expertise of land managers should be at, um, especially with fire. And when we, it's really important that you realize that the fire that we're talking about managing for animals is, is, is a very light fire. And the fires that are based on not burning the whole landscape. So they're not fires that are based on um, your current experiences of hazard reduction or what you've seen with fire where they burn everything black. We're talking about fires that are so light that leave scars, fire scars across the land and leave unburnt patches of grasses and vegetation that don't need fire at that time. And that type of careful burning is, um, is that real master of burning that um, Aboriginal people have been able to perfect in order to enhance foods and to protect um, certain species of plants and animals on country. Um, so you would have saw back in the time um, not long ago on the, on the media where in the desert country they, they found um, fire patterns and scars on the landscape. That's exactly what we're, we need to achieve with our fire management in the country is when we burn, we leave little trickles and patterns around the country and scars in the land that, are, that give different designs every time we burn and not all the burn zone black to the edges right through from the lack of burning and the wrong timing of burning, and, um, not understanding the, those ecosystems and when they need fire. And this is what the animals expect. And when we look at, um, if you can think about how those animals would be thinking, you know, like they'd be telling themselves and telling each other, they'd be saying, you know, once upon a time, people, they knew how to manage the land and they were actually a part of the, you know, the ecology. And people were a part of the ecology because people have been living here for thousands of years with the land and, and the fire management knowledge is just one example um, that demonstrates how people have found that fine groove of being able to manage landscapes to ensure that the country. So, um, but people don't understand that. And because we, it's never been been able to be demonstrated to its fullest, simply because it's so hard to get everyone working together and getting the point to of actually getting that happening. But we're at the point now where uh, an exciting time where we can actually get things moving, we can get burns happening. We've got, um, we're starting to see better partnerships now. And, um, and so I just um, hope that more partnerships um, and everyone here ends up working together and um, and um, yeah, and that, um, you know, please get in touch with us and catch up with Dan Morgan and, and at Fire Sticks and, and would love to um, continue to, to strive forward and um, demonstrating how we can look at holistic management as well, Aboriginal management to support these processes. So um, thanks for the opportunity. Excellent, thanks, Victor. Lots of um, food for thought there and some really important points coming out of that. Okay, last but not least, our final presentation is from Bruce Robinson, um, who's a farmer and in the area, and he's going to talk about farming and koalas. Hi, everybody. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm Bruce Robinson. I farm on 230 acres uh, on the junction of Burrell Creek and the Manning River, um, just west of Wingham, southwest of Wingham. Uh, I, I just thought I'd share... Um, my screen just for a small photo. Yeah, that's the aerial shot of, of, of the farm. And um, essentially uh, the farm's bounded by the Manning River and Burrell Creek. We, 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 we purchased the second farm only two years ago. We purchased the original farm about 20 years ago. So, so the farm is bounded by Burrell Creek and the Manning River here. And uh, I entered into a, um, a, a, an agreement with uh, the government to fence off off the um, off the river and, and the forest at the back of the farm here that leads down to the river. It's a little bit deceptive this photo because that's actually very steep country at the back, at down the bottom left hand corner of the the photo there, and that runs down to the river. And so that area is actually quite a reasonable sized little forest. Um, what's really interesting is is that during the drought and the bushfires, um, we suddenly were seeing a lot of koala there. Um, you know, you could go on a walk just along the edge of the forest and see, see three or four quite commonly. 
you know, with the with the rains returning, um, they've gone back to um, and and the forests recovering at Kawarik and stuff. I think they've gone back over there. To be honest, um, they're not there in such great numbers anymore. I think it was a bit of a refuge for them. Uh, you know, it's by the river and 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 relatively unlikely to get to get burnt. Having said that, those fires were pretty extreme, and and we thought we were going to go. Uh, look, I, I think really the the key the key with um, with farming uh, to to me is 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 that I want to draw on a few of the the themes that came out from the other presenters here today. Uh, one of which is that this forest down the bottom left hand corner here that does have koala in it. Um, it um, it's it's small um, and it is uh, fragmented. Uh, from, from other forest areas and and also it is um, uh, it has great understory in other words we have a, a lot of rainforest type species running through the gullies um, and and then in other areas it's more like a dry land forest so it, it's amazing in its diversity for such a small little area uh, we've seen great regrowth of tallow wood since we fenced it off, um, there was quite a large clear area, which is no longer a clear area. It's now got sort of 15 year old tallow woods mainly in it. The species um, that we see the koala in most commonly are the forest red gum. Uh, we do occasionally see them in the tallow wood and the spotted, spotted gum, but mainly in the forest red gum that exist up the back there. Uh, the front of the farm is very, flat and is, is, is a river flat. Um, we have seen koala down there though. I don't know, really know what it was doing. Um, it was up in Ironwood. Um, we've also seen koala actually in our house yard clinging to veranda posts and, and up, um, up fig trees, uh, native fig trees that is. So um, yeah, you know, <laughs> you often find them in places you're not really meant to find them. Um, uh, I think farming and wildlife can coexist. Um, we're doing a lot of tree planting at the moment, uh, some of which is with um, koala friendly species, some of which isn't because it's on the flat and the flat really doesn't ha house um, gum trees. It's, it's really more iron woods and, and, and um, trees of that nature. Um, but um, we have planted about 500 trees in the last year and, and look to plant quite a lot more in the coming year. Uh, I think conditions are pretty good for tree planting right now. So we're trying to hook in and, and get a fair bit done um, before we experience our next dry period. Uh, I think trees and farms are really important to go together. Um, and by that, I mean, they are mutually um, complementary. And uh, cattle that I run, uh, their milk production falls off over 22 degrees. Um, that's sort of a winter's day these days. <laughs> In Burrell Creek, uh, we had 25 degrees the other day and it made me, and we had 27 the day before. Um, it made me think, you know, um, uh, cattle really do need a lot of shade and a lot of these farms, including mine, um, doesn't have enough shade on it. So um, th there's no reason why we can't have interconnected tree lanes that give habitat for animals and also including the koala and also um, also provide shade for, for, for cattle production or any livestock. Indeed, um, you know, this is a pretty hot area generally and um, livestock like shade. Uh, so I think that the two things can be complementary. You can increase productivity and have better habitat. Uh, the land that we fenced off along the river, um, you know, we put in troughing systems so the cattle don't go down to the river at all anymore. We've been replanting along the riverbank, which is a reasonably thankless task because, um, you know, survival rates are quite low. So you have to do a number of replantings to, to, to get an area treed up. Um, that, that, that previously were what was untreated. Uh, but we're getting there. Um, I think that's the key message. With, with, with the native forests at the back, all you really have to do um, to, to management it is, is try and keep the weeds down, uh, particularly the lantana 
and um, and, uh, and 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 just allow trees to grow because they come back, they self recruit in those areas where where there's already a, um, some forest cover. Uh, yeah, looking forward, um, you know, we're hoping that that we can provide more habitat um, and have a more productive farm because I don't, I honestly don't believe that those two aims are, are, are exclusive. I think that they're the same thing. And I think that's the key message that people from government should be trying to sell to farmers is that, you know, um, we need more productivity out of the land and, and we need more trees and the two are, the two are, um, are complementary. So thank you.